ladies and gentlemen, fellow travelers in the path, friends, Foundation for Universal Responsibility and the Mind Life Institute are once again delighted, honored, and privileged to welcome you here this evening uh, for a seminal, what we hope will be a seminal dialogue between three very distinguished, iconic minds. May I invite Diego Hargatner, the CEO of the Mind Life Institute, to greet President Abdul Kalam, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and Mr. Wolf, Dr. Wolf Singer. Uh, the discussion today centers around the scientific findings and the secular benefits that they represent of contemplative practices. As many of you will be aware, that uh, His Holiness has provided important, significant, pioneering leadership uh, in the experimental work uh, with Western scientists initially, and now embracing Indian scientists and Indian contemplative traditions. And the effort and the, the objective of this evening's dialogue is to continue that process and to share that with an Indian audience. His Holiness has been very keen, as he has often said, that India is the, the guru and the Tibetans are the chelas. So here is the chela who has sought to make this offering to the Indian guru and, and, and the audience that you represent. And may I also sort of use this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to the delegates of the Mind Life Conference, uh, who are all here, uh, assembled here this evening for the event that starts tomorrow. Uh, first presentation. Uh, will be by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, who was the 11th President of India, serving from 2002 to 2007. During his presidency, he was popularly known as the People's President and was celebrated for his common touch and opening Rashtrapati Bhavan to the common Am Admi. Uh, he has worked as an aeronautical engineer with DRDO and ISRO. He is popularly also known as the Missile Man of India for his work on the development of ballistic missile and space rocket technology, and is widely respected in India and abroad as a scientist and as an engineer. He played a pivotal organizational, technical, and political role in India's Pokram II nuclear test in 1998, and was the chief scientific advisor to the Prime Minister and the Secretary of Secretary, Defense Research and Development Organization from 1992 to 1999. In April 2009, he became the first Asian to be bestowed with the Hoover Medal, America's top engineering prize for his outstanding contribution to public service. The citation said that he was being recognized for making state-of-the-art health care available to the common man at affordable prices, bringing quality medical care to rural areas by establishing a link between doctors and technocrats, using spin-offs of defense technology to create state-of-the-art medical equipment, and launching telemedicine projects connecting remote rural-based hospitals to super-speciality hospitals. It added that he was not only an eminent scientist, a gifted engineer, but a visionary and a humanitarian. The government of India has honored him with some of the country's highest civilian awards, and he received the Bharat Ratna before he became the president. His many books, Wings of Fire, India to 2020, A Vision for the New Millennium, My Journey, and Ignited Minds, Unleashing the Power Within India, have become household names in India. While born uh, a Muslim, as his name suggests, uh, he has been a scholar of uh, the Hindu spiritual heritage and uh, has in recent times uh, developed a deep interest in Buddhism. May I invite Dr. Kalam to make a presentation. So you could do it from your seat or the podium, whatever you prefer, please. I will be comfortable there. <laughs> how, how much time I can take? About 15, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. <coughs> uh, friends, good evening to all of you. Uh, particularly, I would like to, my reverence and respect to His Holiness, Dalai Lama Ji, and uh, always I cherish uh, working with him, talking to him, reading his books also. And uh, then I would like to greet uh, Professor Dr. Wolf Singer 
and uh, he is well known in the in the area of uh, uh, physiology of uh, brain particularly brain research is well known and uh, uh, then uh, myself is there and then uh, my friend Rajiv is going to run the whole show. Uh, friends, this uh, I, is a very interesting area. I thought uh, the, what, what you assembled for, um, that means uh, science, I call it science spirituality, a new name I have coined, okay? Uh, science spirituality. Now, all of you can hear me upstairs? You can hear me? No. Oh, very good guys. I am indeed, friends, delighted uh, to participate in this conversation on interface of science and the contemplative science, particularly in the context of our Indian uh, secular ethos. And uh, I'm happy to know this, this conversation as being organized uh, with the purpose of finding insights and effects of contemplative practices using the rigorous methods of modern medicine, psychology, and neuroscience. Have I understood correctly? Okay. Uh, when I'm in the midst of all of you, uh, I'm thinking how science and contemplative science can go together. Now, I thought of sharing with you some thoughts to explain no, I can live without okay, it. <laughs> now, I thought of sharing with you some thoughts to explain to all of you the relationship between science and contemplative science. You know, after uh, the announcement uh, came in, um, um, Dalai Lama Ji asked me to participate, and Dr. Vijay liked me. Message after message, and I was really in Hyderabad today. And up to no, two o'clock, I had worked there. Uh, so somehow I managed to come here. But I prepared a lot uh, because I know audience, very important audience, uh, intellectual audience. So I must do justice. Now, friends, I, I thought of sharing with you some thoughts to explain to all of you the relationship between science and contemplative science. What is the relationship? Now. I personally believe science deals with matter, generally deals with matter. Uh, contemplative science deals with mind. Whether it's a Buddhism or Islam or Christianity or any religion, it contemplates science deals with mind. Matter is the manifestation of physical aspects. Matter is the manifestation of the physical aspects Mind is the manifestation of a consciousness. Now, body without consciousness is too brute. That's what we are having these days. But consciousness without body is too ethereal. And hence, science and the contemplative science are con complementary to each other. That's my view, which reflects the physical and spiritual side of the humanity. When you contemplate, a chaotic situation in the mind vanishes. And when the chaotic situation in the mind vanishes, deep thoughts emanate. A deeper thoughts result in all pervasive calmness. Calmness brings positive energy. When positive energy engulfs, negative elements vanishes. A deeper thoughts result into all pervasive calmness. Yeah, Calmness brings positive energy. When positive energy engulfs, negative element vanishes. When negativism vanishes, conflict in the mind vanish. When the conflict in the mind vanishes, the differentiation perishes. When the differences perishes, all pervasive consciousness emerges. When consciousness emerges, unity in thinking emerges. Unity of thoughts lead to peace in the mind. For achieving peaceful, happy, and prosperous society in India or anywhere, science and contemplative science are the basic foundations, according to me. 
for spreading the basic foundation in the minds of the common man. Contemplative science education has been embedded in the mind through meditation. Multiple methods of meditation. Meditation helps you to understand yourself. Understanding yourself reveals unique you in you. Understand yourself. Reveals to reveals the unique you. Every one of you is a unique you. Do you agree? You are not prototype of other people. Every one of you, unique, unique, you, you are reveals the unique you in you. Unique you in the mind of you makes every one of you break their bounds of acting like everybody else. If you are not unique you, you will act like every, everybody else. You don't want to be. When you find you, when you find the unique you in you, that breaks the bondage of preset mind. When preset mind vanishes, the imagination blossoms. Imagination gives birth to creativity. Creativity leads to unique thinking. Unique thinking rises curious mind. Curious mind gives challenges to the brain. Challenges to the brain activate the neurons. There are 10 to the power of 11 neurons in our system. The unique thinking raises the curious mind. Curious mind gives challenges to the brain. Challenges to the brain activate the neurons. Activated neurons get connected with each other. Networking neurons create optimal path for response. When that cluster of neurons get connected themselves, brain takes leaps and bounds in problem-solving capacities. When problem-solving capacity of the neurons increases, the mind attains the path of enlightenment. When the mind attains enlightenment, wisdom of knowledge radiates. Friends, now, wisdom of knowledge leads to unity of mind. Unity of mind brings peace to the society. Hence, Contemplative science triggers the mind with positivism. Positivism in the mind triggers questioning mind. Questioning mind gives birth to your science. Questioning mind gives birth to science. Hence, conditioned conscious mind uses the science for the betterment of the humanity. So I have given you a flow chart after reading five books. <laughs> <laughs> also, I have a student, he's doing PhD with me, I am guiding him. He's in Anna University in Chennai. Uh, his name is Father George. Uh, Father George, he's a multidisciplinary man, that's why he has taken the brain research. The research he has taken is why certain people are mentally challenged. It's a big area, very big area. Last five years, uh, my student working with me, and finally he has almost completed his research. Uh, I will be, whatever I will be saying, some results from him also I will, I am presenting. Friends, I have worked with scientists, and also I have worked with spiritual gurus. One common factor I have witnessed, the imagination, what, what I'm saying. One common factor I have witnessed, the imagination. And I, and imagining, imagining invention and discoveries have emanated from creative minds. In, invention and discoveries have emanated for create and creative minds that have been constantly working and imaging the outcome in the mind. With imaging and constant effort, all the forces of the universe work for that inspired mind, thereby leading to invention discoveries, not only in science, even humanities, even spiritual side. I'm sure the education system promoted by the scientific focus will nurture the creation of innovators, discoverers in every field. 
Now, friends, before I go into very important aspects, let me narrate the relationship between quantum science. It's a beautiful science. It has come few decades back. Let me now narrate the relationship between quantum science and consciousness. Then I would share some findings of my research student working on the challenges and the cures for mentally challenged children, which would be relevant to the context of today's discussion. Now, quantum theory vividly describes the wave particle duality, duality concept, which can be basis for spiritual, physical duality of the human life, or any other form of life for that matter. The spiritual side of our existence is subjective non-spatial, qualitative, memory-possessing, holistic, and purposive, while the physical body is objective, spatial, quantitative, non-memory, atomistic, and mechanical. Now, the physical and spiritual sides are mutually complementary. Body without consciousness, as I said, is too brute with consciousness without body is too ethereal. The universe is composed of uh, two kinds of uh, basic particles which constitute the universe. They are fermion, fer fermions and bosons. Fermions are physical particles which give us the electron, proton, neutron, and constitute matter and mass. They are always, to some extent, individualistic. The second category, universal particles are called bosons. They exist in various forms like photon, gluons, W particles, Z particles, and possibly gravitons. They, they are all particles which bind the universe through various forces like gravity, electromagnetic forces, nuclear forces, and they are merged together and share identities, hence a relationship particle in the universe. Now, the, a very special case of relationship particle is Bose-Einstein is a fantastic work, Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, which is believed by many quantum physicists as the provider of a unity of the consciousness. If this theory is valid, then quantum structure in the form of neurons would behave synchronously to act as one larger unit. This is called quantum coherence. It makes possible uh, the archer state firing up or all the 10 to the power of 11 neurons in the human body leading to consciousness as known to us. So friends, this is uh, a German physicist. Uh, Fritz Popp stated about this effect the difference between non-living and the living system is a radial increase. Now, friends, I instead of going through further, um, if, uh, if the chair permits, I can uh, talk to you for next uh, 10 to 10 minutes about mind of a father, mind of a scientist, and the mind of a monk. Can I go ahead? Yes, please. Eh? Yes. I can go ahead. Yes. Yes. Now, the mind of father, father, I'm referring to my father, OK? He lived 103 years. You know, he had a problem with me. Problem was, he used to go to namaz. Namaz means prayer, morning prayer. My father used to go to prayer. He used to get up at 4 o'clock morning. And he hit us five times. And uh, at about 4.30, around 5, 5 o'clock, he will be a mask for doing the prayer. So he wanted his son, I'm the last fellow, his son also to do that. He tried his best. <laughs> he tried his best. <laughs> he, he could not succeed for many days. <laughs> he, he could not succeed. <laughs> when I was a 10-year boy, something happened. I had a teacher. His name is Sva Subramanya Ayya. Fifth class, my fifth class teacher, he went to the blackboard. One day he taught how birds fly. He put a sketch, started explaining wings of the bird, tail of the bird, nose of the bird. And also he took us the evening to the seashore to show how the 
birds, uh, cluster of birds fly, why they flap the wing. He taught me in a half an hour how birds fly through theory and experiment. But my teacher is a great teacher. On that day, he gave me something to what I will do, aim in life. You know, that's the primary school teacher. He's so great, uh, the way he taught, uh, he injected in me that I must do something to do with flight. I didn't know there's a flight science in those days, 10-year boy. But uh, I asked my teacher, sir, can you tell me, I want to do something flight. Then he said, you follow, take physics, and uh, then you take aeronautical, aerospace engineering, like that he, he gave me. So I was very happy. I went to told my father, father, uh, now my teacher has given me a big aim in life. You know, aim in life is very important. Because of that aim only, I became a rocket engineer, space technology has started flying in life. But uh, my father said when I was a 10-year boy, you know, you can achieve anything you want, but provide it. You do the God's work also. That is, you have to get up early in the morning. <laughs> 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 then he gave me a story. He gave me a story. Son, you hear me the story. Story is, is an Imam Ghazali. He is a 13th century a saint and a preacher in Iraq. This man, my father is one of the admirers of Imam Ghazali because of his scholarship. My father also Imam. So after uh, Imam Ghazali was Maharib, that is the evening prayer, he was getting ready. When he was getting ready, opening the you know, mat, they, they have to spread the mat before the namaz, prayer. He spread it. Then the Saitan came. You know Saitan Sahib, you know. Saitan, devil sahib. So Saitan came there, he told, Oh, Imam Ghazali, you don't need to do the prayers five times in a year because God, I am coming from heaven. God feels you are a great soul, you don't need to do the prayers. But Imam Ghazali said, Oh, Saitan Sahib, how is it possible <laughs> even Prophet Muhammad was not exempted? How can a poor Imam can be exempted? He went on the... He went on to the namaz, he finished the namaz. But this fellow, the shaitan, you know shaitan, I hope you understand all of you. All of us have inside. <laughs> so, <coughs> so this shaitan sahib did not go. Then he asked him, what can I do for you? Imam asked him, what can I do? Oh, Imam Ghazali, you are a great man. You are a great man because even Adam fell for me. You know Adam, the story of Adam. And uh, he tempted by shaitan, he fell for it. So that's why we are all here. <laughs> <laughs> now, the question here, now the question here, he said flattery. Immediately he saw uh, the, uh, that the shaitan sahib is flattering him. Then he prayed, Allah, I pray, f you leave me from this flattery. Then as soon as he started praying to God, the shaitan went away. But the story was, this is the story my father told me. But after hearing the story, how important doing the namaz, even for a saintly person, that he entered into me. That he entered into me. I started doing the namaz. I used to get up. My father, when he wakes up, I will get up. So I started attending the namaz. He was happy. I was happy. I was doing exam well. I was doing study well and also prayer well. So, okay. So the message I want to give you, you can't separate your education and a meditation prayer. It may be any, any religion, every religion, the theology and uh, spirituality we have. The, the spirituality part of it, the meditation. So the importance of meditation, when I was a 10-year boy, I understood. So friend, this is uh, one thing. Uh, then the next one, a yeah, mind of a yeah, scientist. I had a teacher, Swasubramanian, a 10 year boy. Then I had another teacher when I grown up in Indian Space Research Organization, Professor Vikram Sarabhai. I, he was the founder, he was the founder of the Indian Space Research Organization. 
I want to talk to you about sci mind of a scientist. He is a cosmic ray scientist, and uh, he wanted to establish a research station, space station, in Tumba, Kerala, because the electrojet passing through a phenomena, passing through, and uh, uh, so that electron density, electron velocity, he can measure. So he wanted a land of 400 acres of the land in Kerala. So he went to, and uh, he has, uh, uh, he went to the bureaucrats as usual. He went to Kerala bureaucrats. Bureaucrats said, oh, you are asking a land of 400 acres where the bishop lives, bishop house is there, where a church is there, where a fisherman, thousands of fisherman families, are. how can we give? We can't give. You know bureaucrats immediately. But my scientific mind of my professor is great. He didn't leave. He went to the chief minister. Chief minister said, oh, Vikram, you ask anything, I'll give you, not this land. Because it's a very complex situation. There's a church is there, very ancient church is there. And there's a bishop who is there. How can we give? Then, uh, then one suggestion, chief minister said, only one person can help you in the whole affair. That is Reverend Father Peter Perira. Reverend Father Peter Perira is the bishop of that place, okay, Tumba, Tumba area. So Saturday evening, uh, my professor Vikram Sarabhai went to see the Reverend Father Peter. I was with him at the time. I was a young fellow in those days. So when I went there, when we went there, and he said, oh, Reverend Father, we need a land for scientific purpose. And this is the land, he gave the map, he showed the map. Then Reverend Father Peter Perra said, you are a great scientist. You are asking my habitat, bishop's habitat. You are asking my God's habitat, church, and also my children's habitat, fisherman habitat, you are asking. How can we give? How can I give? Then this, both of them, both the Reverend Father Peter Perra, and Professor Vikram Sarabhai, they had one unique quality. They can smile at difficult time, okay? Okay? <laughs> difficult time, they can smile. They smiled. Then, Reverend Father Peter Perra said, you come to church tomorrow morning, we'll discuss. Tomorrow, next day morning, Sunday, he went to the church. In the church, segregation going on. A yeah, mosque going on, prayer going on, Bible was read at that time. And then after the over, our, our Professor Vikram Sarabhai called for a dais. He went to the dais. In the dais, I still remember the scene, the uh, bishop and uh, my bishop, that is scientist, both of them standing there. And there, he introduced us to, uh, to the people who have come to the church people. He introduced, here is a scientist, Vikram Sarabhai, famous scientist. A scientist, what does he do? Yeah, science, for example, this mic, what I am talking to you, my dear children, it is out of science and technology. And the hospital, what you are having in Tumba, all the equipments out of technology based on the science, health science. Uh, everyday life, all the fishing nets have come out of some of the weaving technology. So friends, science is enriches, um, enriches your life, way of life. What a preacher I do, Peter, Reverend Father Peter Perra said, a preacher what I do, a preacher, I pray for you. I, I wish for a happy life for you. So in short, the science and the preacher, the spirituality of a religion, they all work together to build a good human being. And then he said, Reverend Father Peter Perra, oh, my dear children, Vikram says, Vikram Sarabhai, my guru, says, that within nine months he will build another church, another bishop house, and the fantastic uh, economic center for fishermen folks. Everything will come nine to 12 months time. He al already, the area has been selected. He talked to me. Can we give this, our land with the church, bishop house, and your houses? <clears throat> there was a pin drop silence. Nobody talked. Then what happened? All of them got up, nearly thousand people. I still remember the scene. And they said, Amen. Amen. What does it mean? Church is yours. 
That's the church I built the first rocket system. That's the church first uh, FRP technology was de developed. That's the first, first technologies all came before the big, big buildings came. Today, the church is a famous church because of the, all the space technology are exhibited there. So friends, the message you find it today, they, both of them are not there. Reverend Father Peter Pereira is not there. And today, Professor Vikram Saraba is not there. But the way they connected the science and spirituality, can you think of anywhere in the world such a thing will happen? Your place has been given for a scientific work, space work. Your religious place has been given. Can you remember anywhere in the world? This happened in the southern part of India. I witnessed it. Because they are great souls. So when there are great souls, irrespective of what they are, your religion one side, other side science, they can work together. Finally, at the Finally, they for the best of the nation. This is the this is the one I want to convey to you. First, I talked about you, my father's mind, my science, scientist mind. It doesn't get yielded till he gets the land. It works for it. I got it. At the same time, two science and religion have been united. Did you see that? Yes or no? Third point, I want to talk to you about monk's mind. Father's mind, scientist mind, monk's mind. You know, there is a place called Arunachal Pradesh in our country. Arunachal Pradesh, if you go about 9,000 feet, a place called Thawang. Okay, Thawang. So I was, as a president, I went to Thawang. When I went to Tawang, um, His Holiness may know, it's a big monastery of 300 years old monastery. And the villages I passed through, I landed in the helicopter and passed through with the number of uh, villages. But I find a unique thing, everybody was happy. It was minus 30 degrees centigrade. But everybody was happy. And the village was happy. I was astonished, how is it possible? Then I landed in the, in, the, uh, in the Buddhist center and the monastery. I saw there were about 300 monks, young and experienced. They were all again, they were smiling. So I asked the chief monk, Monkji, can please tell me how, why this area of Tawang people are all happy? He told me, you are a president of India, you should know, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I'm sorry, I don't know. You have you are, you are to explain. Then what happened? He took us, my team, about 12 fellows. There was a Buddha image was there, beautiful image there, golden image. Then he kept all his uh, disciples there, disciple, all of them, all the monks around that. And then before lunch, because I will take lunch only if you give me the reason why people are happy, he told him. <laughs> so he assembled all of them. And then he gave one discourse. I want to tell you the Buddha, that is a monk's mind, how it works. He said, India is known for, for centuries for peace. We have never... We have never aggressed any nation in the 5,000, 6,000 years. Only people came to us to aggress us. But he said, you asked me a question, happiness. First thing for happiness, I and me, you have to remove. I? How many times have I talked I? Remove I and me. If, if you remove the I and me, ego will vanish. If ego vanishes, hatred built in you is uh, get melted. If hatred also goes, then violence in the mind will, will vanish. If violence in the mind goes off, peace, 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 everywhere, peace and happiness. Can you see that equation? The Hmong equations, they gave each, remove I and me, then ego vanishes. Remove ego. Once ego vanishes, the hatred in you goes off. Once hatred goes, 
the violence in mind vanishes, then peace and happiness go together. So the monk gave me how to, but, but big challenge. Removing I and me, try, very tough, very tough. But we have to do that. So this, my father's mind, my teacher's mind, Vikram Sarabhai's mind, and my reverend monk's mind, you can see all the three, all graduating, not only science, science and spirituality, we can see how in our country can coexist. Okay, friends? So this is what I want to convey. And uh, initially I gave you a flow chart. Then I have talked to you, minds of three people. And uh, definitely, I, whatever I talk to, I'll put in my website. You can, you can ask. Uh, the, but one thing I want to leave, my, my student, Father George, he's finding, unique finding. He says, neurons that fire in quick succession wire together. Repeated meditation can lead to wiring between neurons in the brain. He's finding. Based on this principle, we can stitch different parts of the brain by stimulating them in quick succession. A yeah, timing diagram for the same, he has evolved. So friends, he has done a fantastic job, my student, and uh, he is going to submit his thesis. And I have drawn most of the, my, my talk is based on my student's work. Wish you all the best, God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Kalam, for that most inspiring talk and your comments pointing us in important directions. I think it was particularly evocative, the idea that a church should be located uh, in an area that was to develop uh, defense research and nuclear weapons. And I think it sort of undermines uh, many of uh, His Holiness's ideas and the emphasis and the need for scientific endeavor to be circumscribed by ethical values. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalam, for that very insightful uh, speech. I next have the great honor and blessing, which always is a blessing to be in the presence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, to invite him to be the next speaker. Uh, it almost seems like calls to Newcastle to be introducing uh, His Holiness uh, to this audience, but it is part of my sort of brief and, and duty this evening, so I shall do so as best I can. Uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, born of peasant parents, describes himself as a simple Buddhist monk. He's celebrated by millions around the world for his profound insights into the human condition, why we experience suffering, and the ways in which we can all find happiness. This is bred of his deep, continuing, personal engagement and experience with some of the most sophisticated and complex spiritual techniques and practices evolved in human history. And he embodies that spiritual, civilizational heritage. To Buddhists around the world, he embodies the epitome of their faith, the highest human aspiration. For them, he is a bodhisattva, one who consciously chooses to take birth in human form with its inevitable suffering of old age, sickness, and death in order to teach and serve humanity. For more than six million Tibetans, despite China's continuing genocide, he represents their hope for a future Tibet where they will be free to preserve an old civilization that synthesizes the ancient with the modern, making real the vision of the Dalai Lama for their future. In keeping with Buddhist teachings, he continues his efforts to democratize, democratize the Tibetans in exile, and his preeminent global stature and the devotion of his people has meant that he remains its focal point. To millions around the world for whom he is simply His Holiness, 
familiar for his ever-smiling face and his message of compassion, altruism, and peace. Like all great teachers, he embodies what he teaches and practices what he preaches. He follows a regular routine of practices that begin at 4 a.m. every morning and continue for several hours. He still receives instructions and his initiations from other lamas. And at the instruction of my teacher that I should conclude, uh, may I invite His Holiness to say a few words about this. Yes. Since President spoke from there, so actually I should go there, but my one ex sorry, excuse way, excuse now last now more than three weeks, I'm flu, uh, a cold way, and uh, a lot of things come from here. <laughs> <laughs> so I think about I think ten days ago, even a little fever. So uh, I want to get permission from you, speak from here. Okay. <laughs> so indeed, uh, I'm very happy uh, now here to sit together. Since my first meeting, when you become president, our first meeting, we discuss about value spirituality. Uh, so since then, a number of occasions we met. So the more meeting, I develop more respect and admiration. So he, as he mentioned, his background, Muslim, and his profession were uh, scientist. Uh, and meantime, uh, I think because of that background, his thinking, is, it is highly necessary. Science, both science and spirituality, these two things go together, then individual or society will be more happier and prosperous. Uh, then on top of that, the, the former president of this country. I think a country, a few thousand years, all different sort of philosophical thinking develop within this country. Uh, so beside homegrown religion, religions, the major other religions eventually settle this country, including uh, Zorazuddin, a very few community. Now I was told less than 100,000 in Bombay. Uh, originally come from Iran. So they not only settled in this country, uh, but also uh, quite a number of Parsi, you see, uh, participated serving this country, military field, as well as the economic field, and many other fields. So very small number, but they enjoy in this country and make contribution. Wonderful. So I always see uh, telling people, India is the example. Thousand years, many religious traditions, in the philosophical field, big differences, but live together with mutual respect. I think we learn with world, unfortunately, some, some area, the religious faith also become more division and some kind of source, source of division and also causing some conflict. 
even bloodshed. So then, I always feel India, take as an example, different religious tradition can live together. So now, further, India, traditionally very, very rich, so, uh, no, I think, uh, uh, firstly, yes, that I mean, country, uh, like uh, the thousand years, many religious traditions live together, and um, I think a <coughs> lot of different philosophical thinking is developed in this country. I always feel uh, the, among three civilizations, Chinese civilization, and San Valley, sorry, uh, Egyptian civilization, then the Khasa Chutra. Manu Manu. Khasa. Indus Valley sort of civilization. So among these three civilizations, I think India, perhaps, I think, in the philosophical sort of field, I think this civilization, I think, made maximum sort of contribution regarding sort of philosophical thinking. Uh, so you are president of that country, and then modern time, India, you see, they get independence through non-violent method. And then this country become most populated democratic country. So as a former president of such country, I have deep admiration. Thank you. Yet, you always conduct a very simple way. <laughs> a simple way. Yeah. Oh, humble way. Right? Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. So then, uh, perhaps brief sort of report for you. Uh, originally, uh, my own sort of personal curiosity is I want to learn more about the scientific thinking, scientific finding. Then develop uh, a dialogue with uh, scientists in mainly four fields, uh, cosmology, by the way. Cosmology, cosmology uh, the, uh, yes, uh, neurology, and then uh, physics, like quantum physics, then psychology, these four fields, uh, since there's common sort of, or say they, this, these are common ground. So Buddhism also used to deal with this sort of a field. Uh, so in the modern science, as far as external matter is concerned, highly developed. So many useful things to learn from them. Then as far as mind and emotion is concerned, I think the Indian sort of civilization are more advanced than modern sort of science. Uh, so the combine or dialogue and reach both sides. Uh, so then eventually, uh, initially my personal sort of curiosity that eventually become also institutionalized. Uh, so now a uh, number of top scientists really showing interest about uh, the, how is it, the uh, mental science, or science of mind. Uh, that is quite important. Not only uh, you see, expand our knowledge about the inner, uh, in, inner world, but also uh, now I always feel, or I, I often you see, telling people the last two centuries about two centuries, science and technology developed that really changed our world and brought a lot of sort of, our sort of, sort of comfort. Uh, last uh, two, three thousand years, we only pray. Uh, may I say so? Sometimes I feel uh, the effect of prayer, there's limitation. 
<laughs> for individual pray, give some inner peace. But actual change <laughs> on the humanity, I doubt. <laughs> so every, everything depends on our action. You know, I often is telling, uh, you know, the, I think, uh, I think, because no, the panel that I go go. Ka. Ka. Oh, me, this year, me, and partner, the chief, president, chief minister, is it they built big, sort of huge Buddha Vihara. Uh, 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 then the, on the ceremony, for the opening of that from Bihar, he invited me. I went there, and he mentioned at the sort of meeting uh, or ceremony, he mentioned due to Buddha's blessing, uh, the Bihar state will pro prosper, progress, prosperity, prosper, uh, prosper uh, quickly. Then on my turn to speak, <coughs> I know Chief Minister very well. So I responded, if uh, the prosperity, the prosperity of the state due to Buddha's blessing, then this state much earlier should be prosperity. <laughs> Buddha's blessing always there. <laughs> but, oh, oh, Gaya, yes. <laughs> but the Buddha's blessing entirely depends on Chief Minister's hand, Chief Minister's action. Uh, so human beings' action is more important than prayer. That I truly believe. We depend also, as the several centuries, we always pray, but fail to protect, uh, protect us. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, uh, so, so in any way, so therefore, the technology, Science really brought a lot of sort of change and brought concrete sort of what's the result. Then, uh, perhaps I think unfortunately, this this wonderful sort of human invention, invention right? Technology, this through scientific way, uh, sometimes become. Disposal of anger, hatred, greed. So scientific achievement also become additional sort of danger of destruction, like nuclear weapon. Uh, the wonderful scientific sort of because the finding used by human being wrong way. So that's quite pity. Now the, uh, the scientific sort of finding, wonderful thing, in order to use for constructive construction, uh, constructive purpose, the user's mind ultimately depends on user's mind. So more the user, more compassionate, more sensible, sensible sort of thinking, then all these sort of scientific sort of was that? The achievement can be constructive. The user or, or controller of these things, uh, a person who have full of fear, distrust, hatred, anger, then these become destructive. So therefore, they, in order to uh, become Constructive, all these human beings is a wonderful finding. Uh, we have to take seriously about human mind. So, in order to, I said, in order to take care about our inner world, uh, more, more sort of, more seriously, the quotation from religious text, last few thousand years, it worked. Well, three thousand years, it there, but the effect is limited. So now, the people 
generally, you see, first of all, the more, I think, faith towards science rather than religion. So I, I feel like that. No. So the, through scientific way, make clear more warm-hearted sort of mental attitude brings immense benefit to oneself. As you mentioned, the peaceful mind, you see, brings more, I think, balance in our because of physical particles. Uh, so that brings healthy body. So everybody take care about our own body. Uh, and sometimes I jokingly tell him, uh, may, may I say so? Yes. Uh, uh, sometimes I jokingly say, telling our ladies who really, uh, now, uh, when, when I'm passing through so from my place in, up to here, the advertising, most cases, ladies and some, something, something. <laughs> oh. So the people everywhere is really taking care about the, of the outer external beauty. And I think family uh, spent a lot of money for cosmetics. Uh, cosmetics. Of course, external beauty important, but more important is inner beauty. Uh, where there is a real inner, inner beauty there, and then physical, not very attractive, but okay. Uh, <laughs> but where no inner beauty, then even beautiful face. Uh, within a few days, you may call. Uh, so therefore, uh, the inner beauty is more important than external beauty. Uh, so in any way, so in this, our, whether, we, whether is a person believer or non-believer, everyone want healthy body and a healthy family. And as far as world peace is concerned also, genuine lasting world peace can achieve only through inner peace, through full of competition and full of fear, very difficult to achieve genuine lasting world peace. So therefore, uh, all these reasons, uh, now scientific sort of concrete result from scientific research, the peace of mind is something very relevant and very important. We are not talking about next life or heaven or because of hell. We are not talking about these things. Simply, our present life, uh, everybody wants happy life. Uh, the, Happiness will not come from sky, and also happiness cannot be produced by medicine, by injection, by surgery. Uh, and also the peace of mind, you see, cannot buy by money. Right? So we must develop within ourselves. So therefore, uh, now, uh, recent months, recent years, the, some university actually carrying special research about how much sort of effect, positive effect, through inner peace uh, for one's own sort of health and also to become more, uh, sorry, mission to better relations, better relations with other. So in America. Uh, and also Europe, and also Dharamsala, uh, quite a number of sort of occasion meeting such such meeting. Uh, then we eventually we thought, India, all all sort of our sort of uh, way of thinking, the sources ultimate sources come from India. Uh, so therefore, it is really worthwhile or very relevant take such meeting in New Delhi, India's capital. So bring more Indian spiritual masters and also some Indian scientists. Then eventually I want you see, to build you see, the more research work in this country. That's, I think, really very relevant. Usually I describe myself as the messenger of India, the message of Ahimsa, message of religious harmony, 
wherever I go, I always talk this. This idea, this practice come from India. So I consider myself as a messenger of India. Then also me personally, nowadays I discover I'm son of India. Because the one day, one television interview, uh, I mentioned that. Then I mentioned uh, uh, if someone has have the ability to open my skull, then examine my brain, then because of each, each part of my sort of brain fulfilled with, filled with knowledge or thought. <laughs> That's come from India. Uh, and then my physical, this physical looks quite okay. <laughs> so this last 51 years survived by Indian dals. Indian rice. <laughs> so therefore, mentally, spiritually, physically, uh, there's sufficient reason to claim myself as a son of India. So from that viewpoint also, I feel it is quite important. Now this new sort of thinking, combination of modern science and spirituality, and particularly spirituality in the form of secular way, that also the India is the really because of the relevant right place. The India's own constitution based on secularism. So everybody knows secular does not mean disrespect of religion, but rather respect all religions, isn't it? So that's the reason. So I'm very happy. And particularly now in this moment, one German a uh, German scientist, since my childhood, I always sort of uh, admire German hard-working. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sometimes a little bit kasoda, <laughs> oh, and difficult to communicate. Uh, that respect, Italian, easier talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in any way, uh, I really enjoy uh, this short Kazoda uh, discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, it's my privilege to invite Dr. Wolf Singer. He's the director at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt and founding director of the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies. Until mid-80s, his research interests were focused on the experience development, development of the cerebral cortex. He has signed more than 254 articles in peer-reviewed journals, contributed more than 191 chapters to books, has written numerous essays on the ethical and philosophical implications of neuroscientific discoveries, and published several books. He is a recipient of numerous awards for neuroplasticity, the Ernest Young Prize for Medicine, the Zulch Prize for Brain Research, and the Communicator Prize of the German Research Foundation. There is a very long uh, bio note here, and his time is short. Uh, suffice to say that he is a very eminent neuroscientist and has worked very closely with the initiatives that His Holiness has just described. And I invite him to give us an update on the scientific findings of the secular benefits of contemplative uh, practices uh, that uh, the initiative has explored thus far, to give us a sense, an overview of what is happening in the area of why I'm here. So, His Holiness, Mr. President, it's up to you to decide where I should talk. You gave me two <laughs> options now. <laughs> I think it's nice if, if I stay here because we have more eye contact and it's more familiar. Um, so the oh, yes. Yes, yes. Stay here. Oh, okay. Better. Good. So, so my, my justification for being here is, is the meeting that, thanks to your initiative, has now come to India. I have been to several of these Mind and Life meetings, and the purpose every time is to try to find a dialogue between our very, very different traditions, mental traditions, philosophical traditions, in the East and in the West. 
and I'm, I'm a Western child. So what I would like to do is put a frame around this initiative and also sort of introduce the next few days where we will mainly be dealing with, with these questions. And I would like to just share a few simple thoughts with you, um, which I thought were interesting. Because it all has to do with, with human misery. Uh, since man added cultural evolution to biological evolution um, and began reflecting about its own conditions and of its existence, they attempted to cope um, with, with two very unpleasant um, revelations. One is that we are finite, that we are going to die at some stage, and the other is that we that we suffer in our existence. And so therefore all cultures sooner or later developed religions to derive from them a reason for being, a reason and a sense for our existence. All cultures did that. And they also found strategies uh, for consolation. And Christianity thought about resurrection as a remedy and your Eastern cultures thought about reincarnation and um, rebirth. So the problem of finiteness seemed to be solved, at least preliminarily, but there was still this daily suffering. And so in addition, strategies were developed to cope with the problems of this world, and all um, cultures tried to solve this problem by acquiring knowledge about the conditions of the world and then to try to change them. And these strategies, interestingly, they differ radically between Eastern and Western cultures. In the West, analytical techniques have, de have been developed, and this goes back to antiquity, to understand the outer world, the world around us. And the first traces we saw in, in, in ancient Greek and also in, in Egypt, and then this trend went to sleep and woke up again in Renaissance and in the European Enlightenment, which, which was the real birth of modern science. So the focus of inquiry of this initiative was the outer world, and then there was an attempt to change by manipulating this world the conditions so that there would be less suffering. Technological advances, the ones you mentioned. Now the consequences were interesting because they led to a very anthropocentric view of the world with us in the middle. And it also led to an interesting concept of the self, which is very different from yours as an invariable last instance of judgment. We in the West consider the self as the central responsible um, instance that is responsible towards itself and maybe reporting to God if you are a believer. But that's it more or less. And this is probably a consequence of the monotheistic religions which gave us so much individuality and responsibility at the same time. Now, in the East, as I have learned from the many meetings that I now have, thanks to you, you were my teacher and, and all those people here who brought me to this world, um, it, it appears to me that the focus here of this inquiry to understand and then to amend conditions has its focus on oneself, on the inner conditions. And you correct me if I'm wrong. And the tools are not scientific experiments that are reproducible and so forth, but it's introspection, contemplation, and meditation. Now, this approach also led to fascinating discoveries, but of a very different kind, um, because the views about the constitution of the self and about the essence of cognition, the way in which the brain works, or about co how cognition works. You don't put the mind necessarily always in the brain, as I have understood. Also, the concepts on the permanence or impermanence of reality, they are very different. And then the concepts on the relation among the sentient beings on the one hand and between the sentient beings and the world, they are also different. It's much more integrated. So this, these insights, which apparently come from meditation without really searching for them, these are discoveries that come from the procedure, they forcibly led to the instruction of the almighty self. Um, and thereby, and they found this particularly interesting, they reduce the boundary between the self 
and the world. And they also reduce the boundaries, by evidence, between in and out groups. And this is a very important factor in the elimination of one cause, at least, of suffering. Because in the, within the in-groups, there's empathy and there's altruism, but as soon as there's an out-group, these mechanisms don't work anymore. Then I learned that your techniques identified emotions as a prime cause for distorted perception, and that false perception of reality leads to suffering because um, if one has a wrong concept of the world, one can't do the right thing. And apparently, meditation and contemplation is a tool to clear the perceptual mechanism so that you can get at least a better grasp of reality through perception, have a better interpretation of reality, and thereby redu reduce suffering because your world model is more realistic. That's at least what I, what I learned. And then I think, and this is the most important discovery in the context of getting betterment for the world, this is that um, when you contemplate, you have a natural experience of harmony, peace, empathy, and altruistic feelings. And that from there, you can go to cultivate those feelings until they become part of your personality. Now, if this works, this is really a sensational breakthrough. So, it seems to me that the two different strategies to explore the world, which exploit very different sources of knowledge, uh, science on the one hand and introspection on the other, led to, to, to radically different concepts of the world and to different coping strategies. In the West, they try to manipulate the outside world. In the East, you try to become a better person. That's very different. And now, I would like to mention another point which epistemologically is important. There, there is a third source of knowledge in addition to science and contemplation, and this is, this is evolution and early cultural imprinting. Because these factors, they determine the arrangement of the brain, the architecture of the brain, and thereby they, they set the stage for all cognitive functions. So all we can know, we can only know because this brain allows us to know it, and the brain is made, is a, is a product of evolution. Now, this is important because this knowledge that we use in every day, you use for meditation, you use for science, you don't know that you have it because you were not around when it has been acquired. It has been put into your brain by your genes and by early, early learning. But it determines how we perceive, how we reason, how we decide. And so, because all we have is our brain, that does all the cognition, cognition, and because this brain comes from evolution, it must be constrained, it must be limited in its ability to understand reality. Because it has adapted to a very, very narrow range of reality mm -hmm. where life has evolved. And this is probably the reason, um, Dr. Kalam, why we have so great difficulties to intuitively understand the quantum world or the cosmological dimensions, because we have been adapted to this classical physical world between millimeters and centimeters. So our, our cognition is certainly constrained, and because our brain has adapted to solve practical problems everyday life, survival and reproduction, it is not made as an instrument to recognize absolute truth. It's not adapted to that. So this is a serious constraint which I think has to be considered both by the scientists and by the contemplatives because you don't have more than your brain either in order to gather knowledge of the world. And I think that this is an argument of humbleness that, that one needs to consider in both civilizations. Now, let me to, to finish briefly address the question why there is this recent intensification of the dialogue between the East and the West, between scholars of contem contemplative sciences on the one side and scholars of the natural sciences on the other. And I think there are two main reasons. One is driven by science itself, uh, because 
neuroscience and cognitive science in particular, is now able to analyze phenomena that um, are very high mental activities, like perception, um, feelings, consciousness, decision-making, and so forth. This is now all something that neuroscientists can investigate. Now, these are phenomena that exist only in the first-person perspective. Um, they are not lying around here. They are bound to the individual, and they can only be made a target of investigation because there are people who feel that they are conscious and because they can talk about it. Now, um, there is no doubt that, that the richest description of these first-person phenomena, consciousness, feelings, emotions, and so forth, the richest descriptions have been provided by the contemplative sciences. You have a much richer taxonomy and vocabulary about these phenomena than we have. So it's very natural that the sciences come and want to learn from you because this is the object of their research and if the object is well defined, it's very good to have such definitions. So this is one reason driven by science why they now come and want to get at these phenomena because they are so well defined. Now, I would like to emphasize right at the beginning of the next three days that it would be a wrong conception if we thought that science would have the task to prove that contemplative techniques are valuable. It's not necessary. As little as it's necessary that science proves that when you perceive an apple, you perceive an apple. There is an evidence from the first-person perspective which needs no further confirmation. So we are not here to validate, but um, we are interested to understand what the brain does when you do all these, these practices. And, but I think there is also a second and maybe even more important reason. And, and this is that um, the search for remedies for the growing uneasiness and helplessness that I think we all experience, and you alluded to it, when we are exposed to the problems and suffering of our present small world. Because I, re I think we realized on, on both sides of the divide, if there has, is a divide, that the two strategies that we had developed to reduce suffering, they are effective, but they are not sufficient if applied in isolation. You alluded to that as well. Manipulating and changing the outer world conditions is useful, but it has all these unwanted consequences that you mentioned. It helped us, but it also created a lot of additional suffering. Now, changing the view of the world and cultivating one's own consciousness, that's fine, and it also helps, but it's alone not sufficient. You mentioned that sitting there and praying doesn't do it. So both strategies somehow need to be complemented with something else. And because they are so complementary, really, as if somebody had designed it to have go this way and go that way, because they are so complementary, um, I think they need to be applied in conjunction and exploit their obvious synergies. And <clears throat> let me just list what I think uh, we should do. Uh, we should apply science to cope with problems in the outer world, but within a conceptual framework that is much less anthropocentric. So we could take this from you and then use it and apply it. I think we, we, we have to develop our economies further, otherwise we will starve and we will not solve the problem of poverty and hunger. But we should do this not according to the concepts that we have been following all the time, but we should it, do it under the constraints of the human conditions that you have discovered by contemplative sciences. That means we would have to design economical systems that have more trust in empathy, altruism, and fairness, and give these properties a chance rather than destroying them in the beginning. Then I think we should harvest the discoveries of contemplative sciences to improve our education systems and the system to, for self-education of mature personalities that are less dominated by what you mentioned, the greed, the jealousy, the hatred, and those things. And this will be the great experiment to see how we can do that. What is the most effective method? When should we start? We don't know anything about it. 
except that there is the hope that it can be done. And this is one part of, of the initiatives here. And then I think the fourth point is one that should evoke humbleness. I think we should accept that it is impossible to fully control the complex systems in which we are embedded and that we created in part. Our economical systems, our eco ecological systems, and our political systems, they have become too complex. Now, there's a science of complexity which clearly proves that systems with these dynamics, they are nonlinear, complex, they cannot be controlled deliberately, and one cannot hope that they develop in a way in which we think they should develop. It's, un it's impossible to plan them. Now, we know this, but we ignore this, because knowing is not enough to de deconstruct an illusion. I think in order to de deconstruct an illusion, one needs to feel the process. And it is to be hoped that by deconstructing this illusion of an almighty self, to, for which contemplation could contribute, would help us to assume the humbleness that we will need in the future to run our complex systems and to optimize our decisions. So and this is what I wanted to say to finish with, and I, I thank you for listening to me. <laughs>